Hello, friends. Welcome to the Spring Gardening Tasks pro Task Program. Uh, I'm Elena Banjur, and I work at the main library of Kansas City, Kansas Public Library. And today we are here to listen to the presentation of Lynn Lowry uh, with Wyandotte County, uh, Kansas State Research and Extension Office. Lynn, the floor is yours. OK, so. You all see who I am. I am going to turn myself off because I find that people are easily distracted by watching the speaker and they don't pay attention to the slides. So that now that you know I'm a real person, um, I'm gonna turn it off. Um, I do work for K-State Research and Extension. Our office, if you ever need us, is across from now the health department in the old Kmart building on State Avenue. We're in the strip mall that looks into the side of the Kmart. And we offer all kinds of services from 4-H to uh, food and nutrition to lawns and gardens. And so what I'm gonna talk to you about today are what can you be doing right now and into early spring in your gardens. How are you gonna wake those gardens up? And this warm weather has really caused things to pop. I walk my gardens every night, mainly to pull weeds. And yes, weeds are out there, henbit, speedwell. There's all kinds of weeds already out there and they're just getting ready to, to flower. So um, it's not too early to be out looking around and there's lots of things that you can be doing. So with that, we'll get started. If you have questions, put them in the chat and Elena will be watching that mm -hmm. and she can interrupt me at any time and we'll clear up any confusion. Okay, so this is a very basic gardening. We're not gonna get into a lot of deep details about anything. It's kind of a teaser. But if you ever have questions about lawns, gardens, plants, please consult with me and we'll try to help you out. So now if I can make my slides move. So right now, the number one thing you should be doing, and you can start it today, is to go out and clean up the garden debris. So if you have plants already, perennials, for instance, some shrubs, trees that have dropped their leaves, now's the time to pick up the leaves to remove the dead, dormant plant materials. Now, people will say there's a fine line in doing that because if you're trying to encourage insects, beneficial insects, a lot of that debris may contain chrysalis or egg sacs. So probably the best thing to do, if you can handle it, a lot of people can't handle untidiness, but that is to break off or remove, cut the dead stalks and then lay them on the ground beside the plant. If you don't care about conserving insects, and that's a personal preference, then you can shred them, you can crumble them, and they can become mulch. And as a last case, which I do not recommend, is to bag them up and put them at the curb. We don't need to be filling up our landfills with plant material because plant material will degrade and actually become soil. So if you can tolerate it, just break it up, or move it to the back of your garden where it won't uh, be unsightly and let nature take its course. The reason we do clean up our gardens though is it does warm up the soil so that the plants can come to life as soon as there's moisture and warmth. And just as we're trying to encourage some insects, it will hide some of the bad insects like the squash bug that's in the middle of the picture right here. If you can't see him, this is him or her, and at this stage, this bug has a suit of armor on. And the only way to kill it is to stomp on it with your foot or a rock. So these guys live all winter under all this debris. And I've even seen them active in snow. If you lift up a brick, you might find them in your garden area. Uh, they are dormant, they're just waiting um, on things to get lively. The bottom picture is a squash plant that has succumbed to the squash bug. Uh, they carry a virus and they suck the sap out of it. And so um, that's a reason to clean up, particularly for your vegetable gardens. 
Okay, so another thing we can do right now, we leave our ornamental grasses all winter because they provide beauty. They sway in the wind, the seed heads are pretty, the birds love them throughout the winter, but now is the time that you want to remove that top growth. You can either use hand shears or you can, if your area allows, you can burn them. You would pick a calm day like today, very few calm days in Kansas, and you would have to probably get a permit in Wyandotte County to do this. And I can't do that at my house because I have wooden fences all around my ornamental grasses and I sure don't wanna be paying for a neighbor's fence to be replaced. But now is the time to do that. The other thing is we're getting ready to start our vegetable gardens. The first vegetable we plant is potatoes, Irish potatoes, and we plant them on St. Patty's Day or thereabouts. So what you really need to do is take a soil test of your planting area. And how you do that is in the diagram on the right. You would go out to the garden area and you would select various spots throughout the area so that the sample you're collecting is representative of your entire garden area. You would throw all of these shovelfuls of soil in a five gallon bucket you would mix it all up by your hand and then you would pull out a cup or two of soil, place it in a Ziploc bag, label that bag so that when, it, when we give you the results, you know what the area is that you've just sampled. And it depends, the depth depends on what you're trying to grow. If you're trying to grow a lawn or turf or grass, most of our roots are in the four inch area. So you wouldn't have to go down any deeper than that. If you're gonna plant a tree, you would wanna go down 12 to 18 inches because that's the depth of the roots of a tree. If you're growing vegetables, you kind of go somewhere in between, anywhere from six to 12 inches. The secret though, the soil needs to be dry and it needs to be unfrozen. It's kind of hard to dig all this up when the soil is frozen and we require dry samples. You bring in a cup to a cup and a half of soil to our extension office, and I've told you where that is, and there is a small fee for shipping and handling. Uh, we send that to Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas. They run the analysis, they send that back to me, and then I write a recommendation based on what you're trying to plant in that garden soil. The results you get for standard test are pH, phosphorus and potassium. So let me just talk about that a little bit. Most plants, and I say most, there's always exceptions, prefer a pH of 6.5 to 7.0. And those of you who remember science, we looked at acid and bases, basics. So anything lower than seven is acidic, seven is neutral, and anything above seven is alkaline. We have a soil made out of limestone, which is very alkaline. I have done over 1200 soil tests in my 18 years at the extension office. And most of our pH is in that range of 6.5 to seven, unless people burn fireplaces, they take the ash from their fireplace and they mix it in their soil. That tends to make the soil more alkaline. The other thing I find is people listen to the radio. And a lot of times the lawn and garden people tell people to go buy uh, lime and add it to their gardens. Again, you should never do that unless a soil test tells you to do that. So if you just leave the native soil as it is, your pH is perfectly fine for most plants. If you're gonna grow blueberries, which I don't recommend, that needs a pH of somewhere around four to five. So you have to do a lot of altering of the soil pH to grow blueberries. By the time you do that, you can go buy an awful lot of blueberries at the grocery store. So if you're, wanting to do a challenge, you can try blueberries, but you constantly have to be altering the pH to a zone that it likes. When we talk about pH, 
basically what it does is it makes different nutrients that the plant needs unavailable. And that's usually in the form of nitrogen or iron. If you know what a pin oak tree is, and you look at a pin oak leaf and it looks chartreuse green to yellow, it's a lack of iron. And it's not because the soil doesn't have lots of iron, it's because the pH is too high and the plant's unable to take it up from the soil. So when we talk about altering the pH, we would use sulfur to lower it below seven. We would use lime to raise it above seven. And again, through my 18 years of soil testing, only seven times out of 1,200 tests have I ever told somebody to raise the pH with lime. Okay, so our typical native soil is rich in nutrients and is really good for plants. Any questions on pH? I do have a question. Uh, what if your soil is mostly clay? Uh, do you need to lower or up the pH? Okay, good question. Clay, the type of so soil you have, whether it be sand, silt, or clay, those are the three components of a soil. That really does not influence the pH as much as, um, I should say, what kind of rock the soil came from. So in other words, we our soil comes from limestone has lime in the name, meaning that it is very alkaline, okay? The good thing about clay soils, they're very high in nutrients, very, very, very high in nutrients. Sands, on the other hand, they do not have high nutrient holding capacity. So we think we want a sandy soil, but if we had a sandy soil, number one, we'd have to water more frequently and we would have to, have to fertilize more frequently as well. Clay soils hold water and they're high in nutrients. So clay isn't all bad. And I'm gonna give a slide to tell you how to improve that clay. So here it is. You'd think I would have paid you, Elena, in asking questions. If you're gonna do anything to your clay soil, you want to incorporate or add organic matter. What is organic matter? It's dried leaves, it can be straw, it can be that ornamental grass uh, that we just cut back. You wanna shred it, run over it with a mower. The smaller the pieces, the quicker it breaks down in the soil. You've got all kinds of insects and microorganisms in the soil that are eating that organic matter, turning that back into soil. A lot of people refer to that as compost. It's best to add the organic matter in the fall because our falls are usually very dry. You've got the freeze thaw over the winter to allow that organic matter to be incorporated. Even though our soils seem cold, microorganisms are still feeding and working on that organic matter. You can do it in the spring, but sometimes the microorganisms that break that down will rob your plants of nitrogen. So you have to add a little more nitrogen in the spring if you add organic matter. The other thing I wanna say, see that guy with that shovel? That's the best way to incorporate organic matter. Is it practical? No, we would rather get out a high coflutin, a gas operated tiller and let it do the work for us. The key here is you don't wanna pulverize the soil with a rototiller. You want it to be not clotty, but you want it to be the consistency of like grape nut cereal. Um, so it has some structure to it. So you never wanna rototiller until the soil looks like flour. So let's take this scenario on, on the bottom. You've bought a truckload of topsoil. Most people would just take a hard rake out and spread that over the top of that soil. To do it correctly, you should actually loosen the subsoil, either run a rototiller through it or get somebody with a implement 
and loosen that soil. And then you would blend in the topsoil or the compost into your native soil. And that would be best for plant growth. What typically happens if you do a layering effect, if you just spread this pile of soil on top of the existing, how it would work is if it rains, that top layer of soil has to completely be saturated before it will move down into the next layer of soil. And so sometimes what happens is your plant roots will only stay in that really nice top soil and will never go down into the native soil. And then there's always the threat of drought stress when it gets really hot in July and August. Now, one thing I will say is you never, ever, 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 ever add sand to the soil, even though we think we want sand. If anybody has ever done concrete work, you will have concrete if you add sand to clay, okay? So the thing you would add is compost. Peat moss is an example of something you could go buy. You could blend in shredded leaves, shredded straw, shredded ornamental grasses, anything like that. The reason sand isn't recommended is in the soil, you should have an ideal soil would have 50% pore space and 50% soil. And of the 50% pore space, you would have that 25% water and 25% air. When you add sand, it fills the pore space. It pushes out the oxygen, it pushes out the water, and then you're left with concrete. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, the other thing you never, ever, ever do is get antsy and go out and work the soil when it's wet. You should go out with your hand, pick up a handful of the soil, squeeze it in your hand. If it crumbles, you can till. If it stays in the ball or there's moisture oozing out, you don't want to rototill. If you rototill or you dig when it's wet, you're gonna end up with soil that looks like stickers. It almost resembles pottery. Breaking these clods up is almost an impossibility. Okay, any questions on pH, soils, compost, anything? We've covered so far. How's it right now? We had uh, hot days, well, warm days and cold nights and we didn't have any moisture coming down, but the ground was still cold and kind of sticky. Uh, so right now, is it too early temperature wise to work the soil? Right now, it would be up to each person to go out into the areas and take a shovel and dig down. Number one, you'll know if it's frozen. And number two, you'll be able to loosen the soil, put it in your hand and do that test I just told you. I went out into my yard last night and it is far too wet. The temperature, the cold temperature doesn't matter as far as working the soil. It's more the moisture level. Okay. So now people are getting antsy because we have warm days. I saw people out in flip flops and shorts mm -hmm. on the way home today. And it's way too early folks. So the first thing I wanna point out is this picture down here of, of this thermometer. You buy that in the automotive section of Walmart. Um, that will suffice as a soil temperature. You can get fancy and go to a nursery and buy one as well, but they'll be cheaper in the automotive department. And what you want to go out in late morning when the, when the frost is off the grass and you want to stick that in two to three inch depth and you want to see what the temperature is. You don't plant based on the air temperature. Has everybody got that? You go, you plant based on soil temperature. That's a hard concept. So cool season crops, and I'll give you a list of those coming up shortly. That temperature needs to be 45 degrees. Warm season crops, tomatoes, peppers, those need to be above 55 degrees or at 55. 
And then you have very warm seasons. Some people consider peppers, okra, sweet potatoes. Those need to have a soil temperature of 60 degrees. And that would be at that two to three inch depth. So forget air temperature. You really need to look at the soil temperature. So March 15th, if it's not muddy, you can plant potatoes, the Irish potatoes, not sweet potatoes. I've got a picture of potatoes up here. They're called seed potatoes. Somebody called me the other day and said, can I just buy whatever's at the grocery store and plant? Those potatoes have an inhibitor on them to keep them from sprouting in your pantry. So no, I would not use those. Seed potatoes are actually virus free. They're also different varieties. They have not been treated. And what you would want to do is you would want to cut those potatoes up. And you can see these little dots on here. These are eyes. And each piece of potato should have one eye. And then you let those callus over before you plant them. So right now is a good time to go buy your seed potatoes. I've called around planter seed, which is down in the river market. They won't have their potatoes until maybe I think today or yesterday. Uh, grass pads, some of the other nurseries, they already have them. So now would be the time that you buy them. You would wanna cut them up probably three to four days before you plan to plant so that they can callus over um, before planting. Onions, great time to plant onions, late March, early April, beets, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, collards. You can see the list. There's lots of things you can plant in late March or early April. Again, you'll have to, you know, check your soil temperatures, but historically in Kansas City area, we can plant late March, or early April, these crops. Now, the warmer season vegetables, you should wait till Mother's Day. And I have people every year that challenge that when it comes to tomatoes. They will put them out in mid-April. They'll put little towers around them. They'll put milk jugs around them. They'll do all kinds of things. Here's the secret. Until that soil temperature warms up, those plants will just sit there. They're not going to grow. They may look like they're healthy, but until the soil's warm, those roots will not start growing. So you're just fooling yourself if you think you're going to get a jump on Mother Nature. There's actually been research done from a mid-April to a mid-May, and the same variety will actually fruit at the same time even though it was planted almost four weeks earlier. So again, it's the soil temperature and it's root growth that's going on when you first plant your plants. Then once the roots are going good, then you see top growth. Now, peppers like it warmer than tomatoes to plant, but you can be successful in planting them both at the same time. We wanna delay sweet potatoes until early June. They prefer it then, and it's hard to even buy uh, sweet potato slips until that time. Now to have a good garden where you have fruiting vegetables, I mean peppers, cucumbers, melons, uh, tomatoes, you need six to, eight, six to eight hours of full sun. If you have less than that, you can grow the leafy crops, the lettuce, the spinach, those kinds of crops don't require as much sun. But if you want good fruits from your tomatoes and peppers, you need six to eight hours of full sun. Okay, any questions on the vegetables? I do. Okay. Lynn, um, do you happen to know what the soil temperature is right now, especially after we had that frigid freeze? Uh, no, I do not. And again, it would be different for everybody's soil. It would depend on number one, how much organic matter do you have in your soil? Number two, does it get full sun? Number three, um, 
have you like kept a, a cover crop on it or whatever? So uh, you can find out though what's going on at the research uh, stations across Kansas. There's a Mesonet. You'll have to Google. I think it's K State Mesonet, and I don't even know how you spell that. M e s o n e t maybe. And they actually do soil temperatures at all of these sites. And that would give you a guesstimate. But again, it's going to depend on how much shade the area has, um, those kinds of things. OK, thank you. Uh, I have a question. So when you were talking about planting in late March, early April, we were talking about planting from seeds, so planting already little plants. Good question. Most of the time we grow broccoli, cabbage and cauliflower from transplants. We go to the nursery and we buy those. Our soils are a little too chilly to put seeds in the ground for those crops and expect them to germinate. Sometimes they may even rot depending on how wet the soil is. So most of the time people buy what we call the cold crops um, as transplants. Same with peppers and tomatoes. I don't know of anybody that puts seeds in the grounds for those. You really need to, to buy um, transplants. But you can grow onions from those little bulblets or they will sell little plants. You can um, seed easily carrots, um, radishes, lettuce, all of that stuff. I would never buy transplants. You can buy lettuce transplants, but I would just seed those. Um, peas by seed, um, cucumbers by seed, eggplant, there, I would do that by seed. So does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's move on to annuals. Annual. Hey, Lynn, Lynn yeah. before you go, give me a quick, a quick, uh, I'd like to grow garlic. I didn't have a situation where I could plant in the fall. Um, can you plant in the spring and get garlic bulbs by the end of the well, summer, end of summer, sometime in there? That's a good question, Hal. I don't know for sure. I have never tried it. I've always done it in the fall. And you really do it then so it gets good growth. And then, you know, the plant comes really to life quickly. Um, I know Naomi's on here. Naomi, have you tried doing it in the spring? I have never planted garlic. So, but... You know, I grew up in Iowa and my dad planted garlic and I'm pretty sure he planted it in the spring. Well, you would have a shorter growing season in Iowa. So I would give it a try. Okay. I would look for varieties, Hal, that were short days to maturity. Okay. And the final question is, I'm planting onions this year. In the past, I've gotten small to maybe medium sized bulbs. I don't get those full bulbs like you grow at the, get at the grocery store. Any, any tricks to improving the uh, performance? Two things. I think um, number one, people don't water their onions enough. Onions have a very, 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 very shallow root system, like an inch, two inches at the most. And so we don't water them enough to get a good forming bulb. Uh, the other thing you might try is growing them in raised beds where you know they have better soil. Um, and you know, all crops need some fertilizer. Now I say that with caution because people over fertilize their tomatoes and then all they get are vines. So um, the Kansas Garden Guide, which K-State uh, publishes, it's an excellent, probably the best publication on vegetable gardening. And it goes into each crop and talks about fertilizing and it talks about timing of planting, how deep, all of that stuff. So for really detailed information, you can download that free, uh, go into K-State's website. Uh, so I would encourage you all to do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so can we move on to annuals? Okay, so an annual is basically a plant that grows, produces flowers and seed in one growing season. 
okay? And we recommend that you wait until Mother's Day. The key here is for most annuals, they will not tolerate cold soils. Matter of fact, vinca or periwinkle, that will get a root rot if you plant it too early and the soils aren't warmed up. There are exceptions though. Pansies, snapdragons, some of the cooler crops. Um, I've seen pansies go into a light uh, snowfall in the fall. So that's an exception, um, but you really wanna wait till Mother's Day. And I was trained by Dr. Alan Stevens and he would go so far as to say that when you plant annuals, look at them one day and just marvel at the beauty. And then the next day you need to go out and snip off every flower. And the theory behind that is you want them to get good root growth. When a plant flowers and produces seed, it takes a lot of energy to do that. So by removing the flower, the plant can send all of those carbohydrates and its energy to developing good roots. Now, how many people really do that? Mm, not me. Okay, perennials, these are plants that grow for more than one growing season. And examples are the butterfly weed on the left and coneflower on the right. And basically you can plant perennials anytime from now through, you know, freezing ground. We really don't want to plant them too late in the fall because you want some root growth before the ground gets too cold. So I say somewhere in the mid-October range is a good time to stop planting perennials. But you could probably buy some now, uh, put them in the ground. I, that's not ideal because you really don't want anything newly planted to go through these freezing temperatures. Uh, so again, it's best to wait until the soils warm up. But people are getting antsy. The nurseries are love it when you go out and buy plants right now because they know you'll be back. Mm -hmm. When you are selecting flowers, and that's either annuals or perennials, make sure you understand what your garden beds, what kind of light do they get? Is it sunny all day? Is it part sun, part shade? What part of the day is it really sunny? What part of the day is it shady? Because all that will help you decide what flower to buy. The other thing you need to consider is, will it need lots of moisture or can it handle dry areas? And then you wanna plant like plants together. So you wouldn't want to plant a plant requiring lots of moisture with a plant that can't tolerate moisture. So sedums. Sedums are a group of plants that require minimal watering. You need water to get them established, and then after that, they prefer dry conditions. But a plant like lobelia, lobelia has got to have moist soil or it will croak when it gets really dry and hot. So you would never plant those side by side because they have totally different requirements. So just you've got to think about your site before you buy the plant. Don't go buy the plant because it's a great looking plant and then come home and try to find a place that it'll thrive. That's kind of backwards. Okay, so when you do go to plant, okay, you need to look at the tag, the plant tag right here, and it will tell you how big that plant's gonna get. Even though it's tiny, you need to look at the mature size so that you plant it to give it enough space to grow. So you wanna remove the container and people say, really? But I've seen plants put in the ground in the container. Don't know why, but they do. So you wanna remove the container and you can see you're gonna have a root mass here. You wanna make sure first off that root mass is creamy white and not brown so that it's healthy. The roots were dark colored, that might not be a healthy plant. Then you wanna tease the roots apart because if you just pop this plant here into the soil, those roots will continue to grow in the shape of that pot. It doesn't matter if we're planting a tree, a shrub, an annual or a perennial, you need to feather those roots out and then 
a plant and at the same depth it was in the pot. And then once that's done, I encourage people to put mulch around their plants. Any questions on selecting or planting? Okay, maintenance. I believe in deadheading. Uh, it's kind of fit, um, horticulture therapy for me, especially during COVID. I've spent more time in my uh, yard than I ever have just because it's a good stress relief. I don't have to wear a mask. My plants don't care if I breathe on them. So it's a great place to go. I do deadhead several of my perennials and some of my annuals, geraniums need to be deadheaded. Um, a lot of petunias don't anymore, but um, some annuals will benefit from pinching the spent flower heads off. Um, the plant that you see before is um, Nepeta. And on the right, you can see right here is the same plant. It will rebloom. And so, so will my yarrow back here. If I did have these blooms off, I let them turn totally brown and then I go in and selectively remove the flower stalk. Uh, they will rebloom. Um, same with the salvia, which is right here. Uh, they will rebloom. So after the blooms start looking really ratty, you just go out. You can go out with this plant. I just go out with head shears and cut it all, just whack it back as Dennis Patton would say. The yarrow, I selectively take the flower stalks back. So fertilizing, we get a lot of calls on fertilizing. Annual flowers bloom on new growth. So the more you can encourage growth, the more flowers you will have. So you need to feed them with a little nitrogen constantly throughout the growing season. You can use, you can dilute it in water and do it that way. You can buy lawn fertilizer uh, without the, the herbicide in it. Uh, you can put slow release little capsules when you plant, but those won't last the entire growing season. Those will break down pretty rapidly, especially when our soils get warm. Perennial flowers require hardly any fertilizing. Uh, if you're going to do it, you would do it in the spring when they're starting to come to life. So that's going to be about a month from now. But they don't require a lot of fertilizer. If you over fertilize perennials, they will get really laggy and flop. Uh, most of them are used to being on the prairie, especially if you grow natives. And so you want to emulate that. Bulbs. Bulbs are an exception. When you plant bulbs in the fall, you should plant and put fertilizer around the bulb at planting. And in the spring, you do it now. You do it before they bloom. People wait until they see buds and then they fertilize. Actually, those bulbs are gonna go dormant as soon as those flowers die back. So the best time to fertilize bulbs is now or when they start popping out of the ground, the, the foliage. And this is the marvelous um, look we'll have here in about three to four weeks. This was actually um, a person's home in Topeka that used to have tulip tours. And uh, you can see that kind of makes everybody antsy for, for spring to arrive. Okay, let's talk about dividing perennials. You know, there's all kinds of philosophies about when's the best time to do that. And I will tell you, I have done it either spring or fall, and I've had really good luck, either one except for ornamental grasses. I have never had good luck dividing them in the fall. And the reason that is, they're considered a warm season grass. Therefore, the best time to divide those would be now in the spring of the year so that they could get good root growth in the warm soils. They don't get any root growth in the fall because the soils are too cool and oftentimes they won't survive. But why do we divide? Because most perennials will get too big. They'll start to die out in the middle and some will stop blooming if they get too crowded. 
So every three to five years, you should go out, take an inventory of your perennials. You can either dig up the entire plant or you can take a shovel and cut the plant in half or cut it in a quarter or whatever. The key is each of those divisions should have a bud and some roots. And then you want to plant them as soon as you can. Um, because you're taking part of the plant, it will be identical to the parent. Where a lot of times when we plant seeds, especially of these uh, improved cultivars, they'll revert back to the parent plant and won't be the pretty flower that you think you, you were getting. So I'll give you an example of what I mean by digging and dividing. So here is a daylily plant. Here it is growing. And basically what we did is we dug the entire plant out. We shook as much of the soil off as we could. Some people will even get the water hose out and they'll drench the roots and wash away the soil. Once you do that, then you have to tease the plant apart, which is not very easy, by the way. But this one clump produced all these divisions. And some of these could have been divided even further. So once you get this, then you can share, you can plant another bed full. So this is what we're talking about. Daylilies, I've had good luck early spring or immediately after blooming. But the key is if you want to remember the flower color, you need to label it when you plant it in the, your beds. You won't remember, they all look alike. Iris, iris you usually divide in late July or early August. They go dormant after they bloom. Now we've been very successful in dividing these in early spring as well. The key here is when you divide the iris, you want to make sure you have a rhizome. And I like to have two shoots coming off of the rhizome. Here is your roots. Mm -hmm. You need to have some roots on the rhizome to take off. And again, they all look the same after they bloom, so you need to mark them. Uh, you also want to make sure that this rhizome is not mushy. There is a borer that gets in these and will cause these to rot and they're really sticky. So you don't want to plant that. You want to dispose of those rhizomes that are infected. Other perennials, you just basically dig up a clump, try to separate it so that you have roots and a shoot or an eye or a bud and pot them up or take them to another garden area and plant them. Um, they're gonna require some tender loving care until their roots can get established. And that's again, why we usually do it in the spring or fall. We usually have fairly decent soil temperatures, cooler temperatures so the plant doesn't go into a lot of transplant shock. If you were to plant these plants in July and August, they would struggle to get established because of the heat, the wind, uh, you wouldn't be very successful. The only reason iris do well is they're dormant at that point. So they won't come to life for a month after you plant them. Dividing ornamental grasses. Um, I used to have 18 ornamental grasses on my property, but this is what happens when they're needing dividing, the center of the plant completely dies out. And believe it or not, nothing will grow back in that. I've thought, well, maybe it eventually will grow back into the center once that you know degrades and it doesn't. So the best thing to do is get out the whole hatchet, dig it up, and you gotta be very careful because you know those are sharp objects. And you will need to probably use a hatchet because that root system is so intertwined and tangled and tough to do that you, you will hurt yourself trying to do it with a shovel. But again, be wary of using an ax. Okay, any question. questions? Um, yeah, question. Can you, uh, can you divide the roots with a, um, like a saw, like a pruning saw instead of a hatchet? 
Yes, you could. Yeah, now you'll probably you'll probably dull the blade of that uh, saw something fierce, but absolutely. Okay. Because okay. I don't have a hatchet, but I have I have uh, several pruning saws. So okay. Don't do two miles again. Okay. Any other questions on dividing? Okay, moving on. We're about there. Watering is the hardest thing to teach people. It is the reason for success or failure. And we tend to overwater more than underwater. And plants are more forgiving of underwatering than overwatering. Once you overwater, if you'll recall when we talked about soils, you have 25% pore space is water and 25% pore space is air. If that's solid water, the roots don't get oxygen. What would happen if we jumped into a pool of water and didn't come up for air? We would die, would we not? We need oxygen. Plant roots need oxygen, same concept. If they don't have air in the soil, they drown, they die. So when you water, you water a million gallons if you wanted to. The secret to watering isn't how much, the secret is how long before you water again. You want the soil to dry out in between waterings. That lets oxygen come back into the soil for good root growth. If you water lightly or irrigation systems are the worst thing for trees and shrubs. When we water our lawns, we water for the turf, which only needs water down two to three inches. But most of our shrubs and tree and even vegetable roots grow down six to 18 inches. So you've got all this soil that's ideal for about four inches. And then the first time we get a good heavy drought, high winds, the plants really are stressed because we aren't encouraging deep rooting. So the deeper the roots go, usually the more drought tolerant your plant is. So does that make sense to people? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're gonna water with sprinklers, whether it be an irrigation system or this, you know, low tech hose and sprinkler on the end, you wanna do it in the early morning. You never want leaves to go into darkness wet. That encourages diseases. So again, the secret here, go out, dig down in the soil and see how deep that water's penetrated before you turn off the sprinkler. And then you want the soil to dry out in between. So any questions on watering? Okay, mulch, I told you I would get to this. I'm a big proponent of mulch. Now I'm not a big proponent of volcano mulch around tree trunks. And I see that every day I go out and I think, what on earth are people doing? You don't need more than two to three inches of mulch on any plant and you never wanna put it up against the base of the stem or the trunk. That holds moisture and that's not a good thing for the plant. Why we mulch is to keep the soil temperatures moderate. It conserves moisture, it reduces weeds and if it's on a slope or something, it reduces erosion. You can use, I prefer wood chips. You can use straw. You can use the shredded plant materials or any of the debris that we cleaned up in the spring. I do not prefer rock mulch because it's not additive to the soil. As mulches degrade, they actually improve the soil by being incorporated into the soil. Uh, rock doesn't do that. Sometimes rock, depending on the color of the rock, will actually heat up and burn your plants. Sometimes the soil beneath them is slimy. It really never dries out. So I prefer organic mulches like the wood chips, the straw, the plant materials. Again, you only need two to three inches 
I do get calls every spring. Should I remove all the mulch and put down new? Absolutely not. You should just put your new on top of the old. You want that to become soil over time. Okay, pest control. This is a hard one for people. The first time they see bugs out there, I get these phone calls and they want to know what they can spray to kill the bugs. Number one, it depends on what the bug is. We have an awful lot of good bugs. This is the ladybug or ladybird beetle. And this bug is a, is a great pollinator. See the pollinate, pollen on its body? Not only that, but it eats lots of aphids, which are bad bugs. These are grasshoppers up here. And yes, they probably need to be controlled because they'll devour a plant. And this is the stage you would do it. You can see my hand here. These guys are tiny. This is the time to treat. You don't treat them when they're two inches big. They won't, the pesticides won't work. But the best thing for pest control is number one, a healthy plant. And number two, some insects can be handpicked like bagworms. If you see those early on, you can handpick those unless your tree is 20 feet tall. That might be a little hard to do. But I don't always recommend pesticides. Sometimes like Japanese beetles, those guys are around for about four weeks. So if you can just bear with them, they rarely will kill a plant. Um, they will eat the blooms, but I've not seen a Japanese beetle yet kill a plant. They'll defoliate them, but that will usually grow back. So again, the best prevention is a healthy plant. Insects tend to gravitate toward drought stressed plants or unhealthy plants. Okay, so what can you do the next few days in your lawn? We have two indicators. One is when you pay your taxes and two is when the red buds bloom. And that's when you put out your pre-emergent crabgrass preventer. And crabgrass, the bottom picture, this is what the seedlings look like. It's hard to tell them from your other grass, except sometimes they have a lot of hairs on them, okay? This is what the mature plant looks like in August. These are the seeds that you see. There's thousands of seeds on this plant. This is when people call me and want to know when, what they can do to control crabgrass. It's difficult to take a grass out of a grass. So the best thing to do is April 15th, put out your crabgrass preventer. These are pre-emergence. They look like fertilizers. They may even be with a fertilizer. And the secret is you have to water those in after they've been applied. You have to get the herbicide down into the soil area so that when the crabgrass germinates, it picks up the herbicide and it kills it. Any questions on that? I have a question on mulch. Okay. Uh, what to do if you see that the mulch that you put in uh, kind of starts rotting? That's what you want it to do. That is the natural process You'll even see sometimes what looks like vomit on it. And again, that's fungi that's trying to break that down. So I just leave it alone. It's not gonna hurt anything. It's not gonna hurt your animals or pets or any of that. So that's the natural process and that's how you get improved soil. Thank you. I think that is for me, I did put on that website, I put on my email, I put on my phone number. So if you have any kind of lawn or garden questions, please give me a holler. Um, hopefully COVID restrictions will be lifted and I'll be out doing more programs instead of sitting in the office. So bear with me if you send me a note or a phone call. I try to get back with you within the day unless I'm on vacation, but uh, we're here to help you. Definitely. And Lynn, we would love to have more programs like this uh, in the future, maybe the end of spring when we have to plant more plants or the beginning of summer. Sure, um, we can talk. I'm sure everybody will be happy to see more, 
more programming on gardening. Maybe in person instead of by Zoom. Yep. Lynn, did you share about the garden hour? Sorry, I came on a little bit later. Did you share about that? No, I did not, Chiquita. Uh, if you go to our website here, that's on the www, there will be a center section and it will have the Kansas State Garden Hour. And that is horticulture agents from across the state of Kansas are presenting every Wednesday, the first and second Wednesday of every month until I think, I'm not sure when summer and then it dec decreases, but there's a registration that you can click on and then they'll send you reminders. We just had one today at noon and it was on uh, landscaping for beginners. And all of those are recorded. And so you can also get the recordings for those as well. Thank you, Chiquita. Thank you, Chiquita. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm a big fan for the Master Gardeners in Lynn. You know that. Well, we're a big fan of you. <laughs> Hi, Chiquita. Oh, hello. And we won't ask Chiquita how many plants she has in her yard. <laughs> anyway, any other questions for me? I have one last question. Uh, sometimes you can see in the dirt underneath of your plant, if you dig it out, that there are white uh, material that looks like uh, pieces of uh, like yarn or something, white stuff. Uh, I know it's some kind of fungi matter, but does it harm the plant? Well, part of that could be actually the root system. Um, part of that could be mycorrhiza. Uh, so no, I would not, unless your plant is showing ill health, um, I would not be concerned about that. Now, if that area was um, dark in color, brown, black or something, then that's probably a fungal growth that may harm the plant. But if the health of the plant looks okay, I would ignore it. Okay, thank you. Rarely do we have to treat our plants, whether with, um, you know, any kind of pesticide. If we can keep the watering correctly and if we can keep them fertilized, not over fertilized, you know, keep the plant healthy. Uh, we really don't need to do a lot with our plants. If we give them plenty of space, we give them the, the right light requirements. I think most of our plants would do just fine with minimal maintenance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'm going to post uh, the recording of this program on our online programming blog. So if anybody wants to uh, see it again, uh, welcome to find the spring gardening tasks on our programming blog and uh, watch this program again. Thank you very much. And everybody have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank Great you. program. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Lynn. Awesome. Thank Bye. you, Lynn. You're welcome. Everybody stay safe. Bye-bye.